All right, so Old Testament archaeology, a challenging subject to be sure, spanning uh, lots and lots of time. But this is an important part of apologetics. Biblical archaeology is an important uh, uh, discipline that helps us defend our belief in the Bible. And it is something we do have to defend. Uh, we you know, we, we uh, live in a society that has, by and large, rejected the truthfulness of, of God's Word, the truth of creation. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, sums it probably up best, what we're dealing with today. The, the time will come, he says, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to, to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So we're dealing with a world that uh, has rejected truth, the truthfulness of God's word, and they're doing their best to understand, to explain how this world came to be through purely natural processes. We live in a society that's governed by naturalism. And unfortunately, a lot of this naturalism has seeped its way into our theology as well, into the Christian mind. Uh, we see lots and lots of claims made with regularity that uh, some discovery has been made that conflicts with the Bible, that contradicts the biblical history. I mentioned, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, talked about Jericho last, uh, last time we met, and I addressed this specific article by Kathleen Kenyon, who did some uh, archaeologist who did, did some work at Jericho. And she came back with the conclusion that, uh, that the Israelites were not even in Canaan at the time Jericho fell, that it was hundreds of years, hundreds of years too late. And so this is, these, this is the kind of, these kinds of claims and challenges we need to be able to address. Kathleen Kenyon in this article said, parts of the Old Testament where the evidence is contradictory or still absent includes the slavery in Egypt, the existence of Moses, the Exodus, Joshua's military conquest in the Holy Land. She says all of these things are, are absent or contradictory as far as archaeological evidence is concerned. So we want to look at some of this. Uh, we looked at, uh, again, we looked at Joshua and the Battle of Jericho last week, but there's several other things I want to look at. Um, and a couple of big pieces here. I'm going to cart, kind of start with some uh, ancient history, start with looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. And then as time permits, we're going to get into some of the Egyptian history and to see if we can place the Egyptian chronology, if we can line that up with the biblical history. Can we identify who the Pharaoh was when Joseph was in power, or when Moses was growing up in the house of the Pharaoh. Can we identify the Pharaoh when Moses was there, can, or the, the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Can we place these biblical events into the Egyptian chronology or history? So we want to look at that as well, time permitting. Okay, well, let's look at it, Sodom and Gomorrah first. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction dates to around 2070 B.C., um, the estimated dates for the destruction vary. Uh, Usher, Archbishop Usher, who established one of the original biblical chronologies, dated it, uh, uh, it, dated it to uh, 1897 B.C. Others have variously dated it 1896, 2065 B.C. But uh, most of your scholars seem to be land, uh, 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 agreeing with this estimate. This is one of the latest estimates that's been put forth, but it seems to have good acceptance now as far as when this event has likely taken place. We know uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, a terrible, terrible story of destruction. Um, the men of Sodom were, were wickedly sinning greatly against the Lord. And although we tend to think of uh, what was happening at Sodom and Gomorrah as being uh, just homosexual behavior, it was probably much worse than that. It wasn't just the fact that there was homosexuality taking place in this city, but that this behavior, this sexual abuse behavior, had become institutionalized. So there was no, there was no uh, opt-out, if you will. You know, uh, the boys at a very young age were paired with men, and it was an institutionalized thing in, in the society. And that's why they felt uh, like it was okay to surround Lot's house and demand for them to bring out these, uh, the angels to them. So it was, it was, whatever, what was happening there was a great sin and uh, the Lord was, was not very pleased. <clears throat> so he sends angels to Lot to, to help him escape the coming destruction. And uh, you remember that, uh, that uh, uh, they, they tried to uh, tried to uh, uh, stay, the, stay off the destruction by, uh, by you know, uh, uh, debating some with, with, uh, with the angels as to whether or not they would, they would destroy the city if there was, 
you know, a minimum number of people there. Actually, this was Abraham having this discussion. Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So God then destroys Sodom and Gomorrah with the burning sulfur. The Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, what is described as fire and, or, and, as fire and brimstone. Brimstone, or what is also referred to as burnstone, or black sulfur. So it is probably a tar, oil-based sulfur compound that came raining down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They, thus he overthrew those cities in the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. A terrible, terrible destruction. In uh, their textbook, A History of Ancient Israel and Judah, uh, Miller and Hayes assert that the, uh, that the story of judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was copied from secular myths. They, they argue, the Sodom and Gomorrah story reflects yet another motif pattern known from extra-biblical literature. Uh, that of divine beings who visit a city to test the hospitality of its people and eventually destroy the inhospitable city. One can compare in this regard the Greek myths of Bacchus and Philemon, the presence of such tra traditional motifs in the biblical narratives raises the possibility that at least some of these narratives are purely products of the storyteller's art, which of course raises serious questions about their usefulness for historical reconstruction. Now we can find biblical parallels to secular cultures, but uh, if anything, it's the secular culture that has obtained the story, the narrative from the biblical event, not the other way around. Um, the Bi I remember the Bible that, uh, that I was assigned, I, I minored in biblical interpretations when I was in college and continued to use the Bible that we were assigned for this class for many, many years following. The Bible that I had, when talking about uh, the various uh, uh, implements in the temple, uh, the, the altar and the table of showbread, these various uh, in implements that were in the temple, the, even the Bible that I, that I had when I was uh, stu uh, studying biblical interpretations uh, mentioned that Egypt, that they had that uh, basically made the uh, argument that, the, that these temple implements had been copied from, from e Egyptian temples that the same horned altar and these kind of things were used in the Egyptian uh, uh, ceremonial practices as well, arguing that that's where the Israelis had obtained their temple items. If anything, again, it's the other way around. If these same, uh, the horned altar and these other uh, temple items were used by the Egyptians, then they got those from the Israelis, not the other way around. So it's important to keep these things, uh, things in mind. Uh, we want to try to locate Sodom. But the, and this is going to be the main point of what I want to talk about is, can we, have we found Sodom and Gomorrah? And uh, actually, I can't tell you with any certainty yet that we have, but I'll point out a couple of uh, claims. It's, people think that they have found it, but whether they have actually found it or not is, is in a question. Um, this, is, again, is a debated topic. Um, in this 1692 map of the Holy Land in antiquity by Philip Lee, it shows the destroyed cities of the plain lying under the waters of the Dead Sea. And actually, for a significant period of time, this was what was thought. Because they had not yet found Sodom and Gomorrah, it was largely assumed that those cities were underneath the present waters of the Dead Sea. <clears throat> And it was largely assumed that, that they were on the southern end of the Dead Sea. However, between, uh, over the last few decades, um, the, the Dead Sea, uh, some serious, a serious construction project has taken place in the southern end of the Dead Sea to construct salt, uh, to construct water evaporation beds for the purpose of salt production. So as you can see from this picture in 1972, if you see the southern end, you can see the development of these drying beds from 1972, 1989 there in the center, 2011 over there on the, uh, the far side. You can see the construction of those, of those water evaporation beds that they built at the Dead Sea. Now I knew these, the, I've uh, so been there twice now, and I knew that these were there, but you, I still couldn't, you can't see them from the ground. These are massive ma dividers out there in the Dead Sea. And unless someone pointed them out to you, you wouldn't even know they were there because this is a massive, massive uh, sea and you just really can't spot them. But the hotels, just so you know, the hotels of the Dead Sea where you would stay are located in the 
the southern end of the Dead Sea, next to those evaporation beds. So when you go and float in the Dead Sea, you're not floating in the normal part of the Dead Sea, you're floating in the part that where they have intentionally if, are working to evaporate the water to produce salt. So it's a much higher salt concentration in that part. Nonetheless, the construction that was done in the southern end of the Dead Sea proved rather uh, conclusively that there were no buried cities of the plain in that area because in order to do that construction there, they had to uh, ex excavate all that away, plane it off. And so no cities of the plain were found down there in the southern end of the Dead Sea. But uh, it has been largely assumed that the, the cities of the plain were in the flat areas, either on the, on the northern or the southern end of the Dead Sea. So it's, it's generally thought that they might be on the southern end of the Dead Sea. And a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, historical and uh, uh, reasons for assuming it is on the southern end. Uh, what, we, what the Bible refers to, the cities of the plain would have been in a, an open area, a plain type area. And there's some open area on either the northern or the southern in the Dead Sea. So it could be there on the southern end, possible. However, it could be up on the northern end as well. There's a large plain there on the northern end as well. So we want to look at these a little bit. This map uh, from uh, Carl von Spruner's, uh, uh, this is an 1865 map of the Holy Land in antiquity that shows Sodom on the southern shore, uh, actually the southwestern shore, it, within what is referred to as the Valley of Salt or Valis Sal Salinarum, shows there the Sodom located on the southwestern edge of the Dead Sea. And if you'll note, I put, uh, pointed an arrow to Zor, which is... Uh, identified there on the eastern edge of the, of the Dead Sea. Zor is very important for identifying the location of Sodom, so I'm going to refer to it again. But uh, anyway, just some, some, uh, some, a little bit of debate uh, historically about where these cities were located. So we need to uh, look at the biblical text for some identifications, some uh, placeholders to try to figure out where Sodom and Gomorrah was in the Dead Sea area. Okay. Part of the text here refers to a Mount Nebo. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev, and he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev to as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. The location, that location is Mount Nebo. And we can place Mount Nebo on the map. It's located right there on the northern end of the Dead Sea. And from that location, you can look down on the Jordan Valley and see what is a, a fairly fair, a well watered plain. There's agricultural activity there. Again, that's uh, there on the northern end of the Dead Sea, looking west from uh, Mount Nebo. That's where you are there. Another little bit of the biblical text helps us identify another spot here. Uh, and this is uh, the, where the Oaks of Mamre were located at, at, at Hebron. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he stood before the Lord. That's uh, which are in Hebron, the Oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron from uh, Genesis 13. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. So Abraham was looking down uh, on this, the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Sodom and Gomorrah was located from Hebron, seeing that smoke rising up like a furnace from that location. So on the western edge of the, of the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. There's a few other references, a few other reference points we can note. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah were f two of, of five cities referred to in the scripture as the cities of the plain. Um, and so based on uh, this following reference, we can conclude that they were in the Dead Sea region for sure. There's a, there's a re reference to a war that's, uh, uh, that takes place between the kings of the cities of the plain, of which five are mentioned. Now the valley, valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. So there was this war mentioned, and it mentions these tar pits that the kings of the valley of the, of the, the Siddim, uh, which is the, 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 valley, the valley of the plains, the salt plains here. Uh, and uh, we can find actually some reference to these tar pits 
And all, there are, as far as I know, there are, are no tar pits or sinkholes that have been discovered in the northern end of the Dead Sea. These are all in the southern end of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea in ancient times was called Lake Asphaltites. So asphalt is just what we call that tar stuff that we put out there, tar and gravel we call asphalt. And so just what, what tar is, is, is asphalt. Josephus, the Jewish historian Josephus, called it Lake Asphaltites in uh, the Antiquities 1.9. And the Romans called it Asphalt Lake. Bitumen was also a major exporter of the Dead Sea region. This specific publication in, from 1936 is from the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And it notes the presence of oil deposits in the Dead Sea region. Oil and bitumen. Uh, exudations authentically reported throughout the Dead Sea area and best observed in the ravine behind Jebel, Jebel Ustum may or may not indicate the presence of important oil deposits, but some indications of suitable structure exist. At any rate, archaeology and geology unite with seepages to confirm the biblical account of Sodom's destruction. Now that's from, uh, I know it's a 1936 publication, but that's from the American Association of Petroleum Geologists mentioning the con confirmation about these oil seepages and the, and the biblical account of Sodom's destruction. I mean, can you imagine a biblical reference coming out in one of our science journals these days, you know? Uh, yeah, things have changed. Okay, so it mentions, though, this uh, Jabal Usdom, um, and here is the location of, uh, of this uh, this location uh, mentioned in uh, the American Associated Petroleum Geologist Journal, which is known also as Mount Sodom. So this is a mountainy area at Jabal Ustam Mountain, also called Mount Sodom, is located right there, again on the southern end. This map here shows the location of the sinkholes that have been uh, found around the Dead Sea from some recent surveys. And uh, as a, uh, you know, at and this would have been where these bitumen pits were, we think, during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, where these sinkholes are. So sinkholes are mostly on the southern end and western edge. There where uh, Mount Sodom is. But uh, in determining which, which, you know, the best location for Sodom and Gomorrah, we need to look at Zor. Zor is an important reference point for us. We know that Sodom was in close proximity to Zor because uh, Lot fled there. He asked the angels if he could specifically flee to Zor and reached it by midday. He left in the morning and was able to reach Zor fleeing with his family by midday. So it had to be fairly close. Lift up, uh, lift, uh, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of the Jordan and that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zor. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus he separated from each, thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as, uh, as Sodom. So Zor is an important location for us that we need to uh, try to put to a map. And that has, there's good historical evidence to support the location of Zor. And I can't say this with any certainty, but uh, there's an ancient map um, that shows the location of Zor. This is what's called the Madaba map. And this, uh, Madab, this, the location of this church is actually way up on the northern end of the Dead Sea. Where, on the northern eastern edge of the Dead Sea, this church is located. And it shows the location of Zor on the southern end, which seems important. So the Madaba map is a mosaic map on the floor of this church. This is the, the Greek Orthodox Basilica of St. George in Madaba, Jordan. And it depicts Palestine in the 6th century. The map, the map itself dates to the 6th century A.D., um, so you can see a little portion of the map here. Um, if you look up on the top of that, of that picture, that you can see the Dead Sea and the Jordan coming into the Dead Sea on the top. What you see on the bottom end, that's Jerusalem. Uh, the large circular shape, that's Jerusalem. Names, names, names. It was a, a very busy map. Okay, but on this map, okay, I'm going to show you, this is, this is again uh, 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 the Dead Sea right there, and you can see the Jordan coming into the Dead Sea from the north end, but you notice there's nothing going out the south end, because there's no, water doesn't leave the Dead Sea, it only comes in the Dead Sea. 
okay? But on this map, there is a Zor is identified and uh, a, 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 the sanctuary of St. Lot, which was in a cave next to Zor. So uh, this place is ancient Zor in the vicinity of uh, what is today modern Safi. Uh, the Madaba map also depicts, uh, the, again, what we call the Sanctuary of St. Lot, uh, a church built in memory of Lot, which was built in front of a cave thought to be where Lot and his daughters had fled to. Um, but, uh, you know, people it just, they ended up, so I'll, I'll show you the, the cave. Can't really say for sure, was this the cave that Lot and his daughters fled to? No, but there's some good historical uh, so support for this. Uh, let's look at a little more of the text. Remember that Lot, uh, that Lot was able to travel to Zor within a day, which places it uh, in close proximity to Sodom. Uh, but Lot said to them, I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. It is, it, is it not small? that my life may be saved, he said to him. Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zor. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor, which means it was midday. The sun was over the earth and Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone or what we call burnstone, and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his daughters lived in a cave. So they moved to Zor, but then they got afraid of staying in Zor, possibly because it was de determined the people might have known that he had fled from Sodom and perhaps was the cause of the destruction of Sodom, perhaps. The sanctuary of St. Lot was built on the site of the cave traditionally held to be uh, where Lot and his daughters lived. This was only recently discovered. Uh, archaeological excavations between 1989 and 1993 have identified this sanctuary. It was actually discovered almost by accident. Someone literally fell through a little hole and realized there was a cave there, and, and uh, there you go. So that they discovered the church from that. But they, there was, a stone was also found uh, inside the cave bearing the inscription, St. Lot. But... Uh, no, no telling when that inscription was made. You know, no telling when. So, uh, but today there is a museum that opened on the site, just opened in 2012. So there's now a museum that uh, there at the sanctuary of Saint Lot. They're located in Zor. So Zor is shown on the Madaba map on the southeastern shore of the Dead Sea, just south of uh, J the Jared River, or what we call the Wadi Hassa. This place is ancient Zor in the vicinity of modern Safi, which is located right there. Now, uh, Bryant Wood uh, has proposed that the five ancient town sites found near Zor on the southern end of the Dead Sea are the cities of the plain, including Sodom. Now, he has a PhD in uh, Syro-Palestinian archaeology from the University of Toronto in 1985, and he performed his dissertation on Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age. So he identifies this entire southern end of the Dead Sea, where those water evaporation beds are now, as being the Valley of Siddam, or the city, where the cities of the plain were located here. And he places these five archaeological sites, these excavated ancient cities, as being the five cities of the plain. So he puts uh, Safi as being Zor, Ben Bad Edra as being uh, Sodom and Numera as probably being Gomorrah. There's apparently some linguistic connections that can be made with uh, those names. Um, many times the ancient names are preserved in modern Arabic uh, place names, and, and that's the case for some of these. Gomorrah, and uh, in particular, there's a good numer uh, a linguistic connection with Numera, but. Let's look at Badadra. This was, uh, again, the site that uh, Bryant Wood believes was probably Sodom. Badadra has been heavily excavated and explored by archaeologists. And uh, the site includes both the town site that is located, 
Let me point that out to you. The town site located right there. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and cemeteries. There was uh, also another occupational area east and southwest of the city walls. Um, but uh, the size of the cemeteries in particular struck me. I mean, uh, the, the town site of Bada Dra is only about uh, 10 acres. Most of your town, town, fortified town sites are about that size. Uh, and, and although this was a site that was probably occupied for maybe a thousand years, um, the, it is estimated that the town could have held uh, uh, that even what's the, over the thousand year history of the town, that an, the estimated 20,000 tombs would have... Uh, uh, Anyway, it's estimated that the tombs that they found there could have held as many as a half a million people. Seems like a, an extraordinary number of tombs for a town of this size. And so it has been argued that this might have been the regional cemetery, not just the cemetery for Sodom, but a regional cemetery as well, being able to uh, hold uh, approximately half a million people and uh, over three million pottery vessels were, were, have been discovered there. Here is an enlarged view of the Badra town site that you see there. Although the northern wall was lost due to some erosion, it is estimated that, that, uh, that it was again about uh, 9 to 10 acres in size. And it's been heavily excavated. You can see the remains there of a city wall, a remains there of a, of a gate. I don't know, you can't see it well either, but uh, if you look over the edge of that wall, you can see mountains in the background. Remember, the angels uh, told Lot to flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Following the destruction, there was uh, occupation at Badadra in the early Bronze IV period, but almost exclusively outside the destroyed uh, fortified town. Um, Bryant Wood uh, makes this uh, summary. Shortly thereafter, he says, at the close of the early Bronze III period, the fortified city of Badadra met a final fiery end. The northeast gate was destroyed by fire, as indicated by charcoal, broken and fallen bricks and areas of ash. There was a massive pileup of mud bricks in the west end, suggesting heavy destruction in this part of the city. At this time, the city wall fell, and the mud brick superstructure of the sanctuary collapsed, apparently after burning. One of the... Uh, one of the, the, the features there that was executed by, by Bryant Wood were some of these charnel houses. Uh, a charnel house was a, a place where they would go and lay a body out to desiccate, like, a, like they would in tombs. So it was a place where they would store them for a brief period of time. This charnel house, so the, this was the largest of the charnel houses that he uh, did this drawing for in his publication. Uh, but this structure was destroyed by fire at the same time the city was destroyed, but he notes that, uh, that the roof apparently caught fire first. The fire started on the roof and then spread to the interior when the roof collapsed. So good, at least uh, provides some graphic evidence of, uh, of a fire raining down from above. But then again, I think during wartime, uh, you know, fiery arrows are what uh, your enemies shot into your cities as well. Fire would probably start on the roofs during conquest as well. That's, what, that's my thinking on that. Here's another look at uh, some of his work on one of these charnel houses. Again, uh, roof caught fire first and then collapsed into the interior structure. Bryant Wood again, the building has been severely burned. Remnants of, uh, of charred posts and beams from the roof were found among the ruins. Much ash was also found, along with bricks that were turned red from the intense heat. More intriguing than the mere fact that the charnel house was destroyed by fire, however, is the way it was burned from the, out, from the, from the inside out. It is now evident that the roof engulfed, became engulfed in flames, collapsed in the building, and caused the interior burning. But he also did some uh, excavations at Numera. So this is just some, uh, pic some of his photos from Numera in his uh, publication following uh, his 1977 season of excavations. Numera was occupied for less than a century, apparently. The remains were better preserved at uh, Numera than at Badadra. They found textiles, string, rope, seeds, and even a cluster of grapes. Uh, survived, uh, survived the fire. Two victims shown here of the destruction of Numera. Two skeletons were found uh, adjacent to one of the towers lying in some ashy debris. 
Michael Coogan, one of the excavators of Numera, described what was found there. He says, under the topsoil, a desert pavement, and a naturally deposited windblown sandy soil, the entire area was covered by ashy debris of the final destruction of the town, up to about 0.4 meters in depth. This ash contained fragments of wooden beams that had, that had supported the roofs of the dwellings and lay immediately over the latest occupational layer within each room, sealing the material beneath it. Not infrequently, there was mud brick debris over the ash, which had resulted from the collapse of the mud brick superstructure after the con final conflagration. Hmm. So that is one possible location of Sodom and Gomorrah. But uh, recently, another location has been put forth by uh, this guy, Stephen Collins, is a, is a biblical archaeologist that has uh, put forth a new site on the north end of the Dead Sea. He's arguing for a northern, the northern plain area there, rather than the more traditional southern area. He's a professor at Trinity Southwest University and has a PhD in biblical history and religion. One of the key biblical references that caused him to start looking in the northern end was uh, an interpretation of the word plain that is used here in the text. Um, again, this is the text that we'd already seen. Lot, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of the Jordan that was well watered. So Lot chose for himself the valley of Jordan. And uh, another possible uh, in another possible rendering of that hebrew word valley is actually circle he uh he he uses the word disc uh, steve collins used the word disc most frequently so that's apparently a but it apparently another uh, possible interpretation of that but in my my nasb bible when i i checked it recently and there's a little footnote a little uh, pop-up footnote there next to both of those words plain in that passage and mine says literally it means circle so that word plain in the text literally means circle. So it was a plain that was, you know, roughly circularly shaped or that kind of thing. And uh, Steve Collins points to the northern end of the Dead Sea as being a better location for this. Now, one of the problems we have here is that we're not really sure how significantly different the topography of the area is today versus in 2000 B.C., I mean, that's a long time ago for, for us to expect the topography of this to remain unchanged, for the height of the Dead Sea to have not significantly changed over time. It's tough to have to fathom. But this map, uh, this map that I actually obtained from Steve Collins uh, shows some of the major geographical findings near what he believes is Sodom. Okay, let me show you some of these. There's the Jordan River coming at the Dead Sea. When uh, during spring, the Dead Sea will swell up a bit. That's the spring inundation, which actually gets a little higher at some time. So the, the Dead Sea does swell up into this plain area significantly. But the, even with that, there's still a fairly large flat area there on the north end of the Dead Sea. And he argues that this area is what's better described as the circle or the disc. This so uh, a word, uh, kikar is uh, the Hebrew word for that. There's something wrong with that slide. Okay, show you some of the other, uh, there's a major trade routes in this area, and we know that Sodom was on a major trade route. Uh, over on the southern end, that's where Jericho is located, right? And on the eastern end is uh, the largest tell that they found in the area other than Jericho called Tel El Hammam. And uh, Steve Collins argues that Tel El Hammam is in fact Sodom. Okay, um, just so you know, the word tell, which is spelled in this slide T-A-L-L, -T -L -L, T, so it's tall or tell, a tell is a hill that is not a natural hill, but one that's grown up over time as a city it occupies that area for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So when a city stays in exact lo location, it, the site just gets higher and higher and higher, and uh, in they at some point realized that all of these little hills dotting the landscape were probably not natural hills at all, but were in fact ancient cities. And they've started uh, doing excavations on any hill in the region to determine if it's natural or in fact uh, a tell. So uh, there at Tel El Hammam, there are several other cities. So there are 
five cities, and uh, Steve Collins points these cities out as being probably the five cities of the plain. Problem is, there's a whole bunch of others. I mean, all the, so the red dots are what he says are the five cities of the plain because they were slightly larger, but all the purple dots are other city sites, what he, they, they would, you know, satellites of the main Tel, Tel El Hammam city. Okay, but again, this is the location that we looked at before from Mount Nebo. If you look down from Mount Nebo, you're seeing that spot down there is what we're looking at. That is the immediate vicinity of the Tel El Hammam, where the steam calls believe was Sodom. And this is the actual location of those tells. So from Mount Nebo, looking down at the watered, uh, well-watered plain of the Jordan, that's kind of what you see from that spot. So, I mean, it's a compelling spot for sure. Um, let's see what else I want to show you here. I can give you a look at this tell. So, this, what I'm going to show you is the upper Hammam tell, which looks like that. So, that's what you're looking at. So, that is not a natural hill. That's due to a city that was there for like a thousand years. And think about all those pottery shards and all that. That just becomes more ground and more ground and more ground. It just grows up over time. So Steve Collins did a lot of work at this location and identified the history of the site. Let me just kind of run you through kind of the history of the site. We need to pay attention to this. We're going to go on for starting from further back in history and coming to more recent. Okay, so the early Bronze II period, there was a large wall, city gates there in a gateway, a couple of villages outside the main fortified area the area protected by the city wall. This, remember, and, and I passed by the slide pretty quick, but there was an upper and lower tell. The upper portion is the part that had been occupied for a greater period of time. The main fortified area, this wall encompasses both the upper and lower portions of this. A little bit later, Middle Bronze 1, 2, uh, palaces were constructed. Some, uh, some uh, guard towers were placed within the wall. A uh, monumental gate, new gateway was installed during uh, this period. Some earthen mud brick ramparts were installed as well. Uh, a big temple and administrative complex can be found during this period. Late Bronze II, nothing. So you had this, you had this one period of serious collapse. Okay, I'm going to back up. And back up. I got, I got. So, first, early bronze two, middle bronze one, two. It got a lot more activity there. Then late bronze two, nothing. Just one little tariff house was in, uh, in use or during this period of time. The site wasn't completely abandoned. Uh, during the Iron Age two, three, a new wall was built around the city. Um, some monumental buildings and houses were erected, a temple and some other structures. Okay, but this is this is Steve Collins' conclusion on this being Sodom, uh, uh, and when the destruction occurred, basically is that the town was really big, and then suddenly there was no activity there. So this is this is his slide again that shows the occupational periods at this site of Tel Hamam, Tel El Hamam. Okay, the thickness and width of each of these colored lines tells you the am amount of occupation of that city. Okay, so, mm, 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 mm. okay, see what happens there. And then after the Middle Bronze 1 2 period, you have a sudden collapse. But uh, he places this, uh, this period, this uh, uh, late Bronze 2 A period, is dated at 1350 BC. 1350 BC, and yet the actual biblical date of the destruction of Sodom is closer to 2070 BC. So we're talking about a difference of like many, many, many hundreds of years here. 2070 to 1350, I mean, talking about 650 year difference. And eh, I don't know, I'm just not uh, real comfortable accepting this, that, to be Sodom, if uh, the, the dates conflict with the Bible so significantly. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit concerned about that. There are a number of problems with assigning Sodom uh, to this location. One, again, is the distance between this location and Zor. If that, if that site near, next to modern Safi down on the southern end is in fact Zor, identified on the Madaba map and identified 
uh, and by the sanctuary of St. Lot that's built there next to it, that's a good distance of about 50 miles. And yet from Badadra, where that uh, Bryant Wood had placed it, down to Zor is only about 15. 15 is still a pretty good stretch to reach there by midday. But if you're fleeing because you know fire and brimstone is going to come down on top of you, I think you're going to you're going to reach it in, you know, by midday for sure. But uh, there's a significant uh, distance that you're dealing with here to go all the way from that southern, from that northern end where that plain is, all the way down to Zor. And I noted that uh, on Steve Collins' map, he actually locates one of those, uh, I don't know if I want to jump back and show you, but uh, I guess I can. Uh, on his map right here, he actually, sh I don't know if you can, s I don't know if I can show you this, can I point to that? Uh, if you look, there's a road on the coming down from Tel El Hamam. Can I go over here? There you go. So he identifies this road as Tazor. On his map, he seems to acknowledge that, that this road leads to Zor, but later he actually identifies one of those cities as being Zor. So, so anyway, still not clear on that, uh, but uh, some people have taken him to task on this, uh, including a distinguished professor of Old Testament, uh, Old Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, has, uh, has, has challenged him on this ground. Uh, Eugene Merrill, again, a distinguished professor of Old Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, and uh, author of Kingdom of Priests, A History of the Old Testament Israel, um, it shows, it points out a number of problems in, an, in a recent Artifacts article that, uh, for Tel El Hamam as being Sodom. Uh, and he tends to take, uh, take uh, Steve Collins to task on this quite a bit. However, he says, both archaeological and biblical chronological data rule out Hamam as a candidate for the patriarchal so Sodom. After a great deal of analysis, Collins has concluded based on stratigraphy, pottery assemblages, destruction layers, and architectural features that the evidence points to the, the late Middle Bronze II period, six, about 1600 uh, BC, for the cataclysmic overthrow of the site, thus necess necess necessitating a date for Abraham Lot narrative at the same time. But it's precisely at this point that Hamam must, on biblical grounds, be precluded from being a candidate as one of the cities of that narrative. He points out a number of problems. The, the chron a chronological system of the Hebrew Masoretic text places the era of the patriarchal period between 2100 and 1700 BC. All subsequent biblical historical accounts will no longer jive with each other or fit the periods to which a 1600 date assigns them. Besides the mantling of the biblical chronological schemes and the rendering of their data as incorrect or meaningless, other numerical features such as the lifespans of patriarchs must also be discarded as radically reinterpreted. But most serious of all, he says, to the conservative scholar at least, is the methodological fallacy of testing and assessing biblical information in light of presumed archaeological primacy and the necessary shift of the ground of authority from text to tell. This is a bit of a problem. I mean, if we, if we don't place the Bible first, then uh, where are we? We're back there with the secular few. And Steve Collins even makes a statement to this effect that he's okay with this. And this is Steve Collins. Uh, on the one hand, he says, it is intellectually dishonest to dismiss the Bible as a site selection parameter. There is no doubt that the Bible remains one of the best ancient geographic texts available to archaeologists and historians, and particular interest is generated in certain areas because of potential biblical connection. This is reality. On the other hand, doing archaeology solely from a biblical perspective can mean missing the larger reality of Near Eastern culture milieu. The, a biblical bias might possibly influence the interpretation of data which ironically could otherwise be used to illuminate the biblical narrative itself. So I leave it to you to decide whether and which of those sites you favor more for Sodom and Gomorrah, because I think the court's still out on all this. Uh, I like the northern end, the, the trade routes that come into that area, the fact that it's a, it's a much wider open plain there. I like the site, but... Uh, and I'm willing, to, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that the dates of that site are simply that far off. That our secular dates for these bronze and iron age periods are just that far off. 
If this is the site of, of, site of Sodom and Gomorrah, then we need to reset the date for that site or for this period and use that date to correct for the other uh, dates before and after. Okay, one of the things, uh, so just to mention uh, of the cause of the destruction, just a little bit. Rem remember, uh, the Bible says that, that brimstone and fire from the Lord fell down. And again, what brimstone is, uh, the brimstone otherwise kind of means burn stone, which means a sulfurous black, a sulfurous oil, or what they call a black sulfur. And in Genesis 19, 28, he says, he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the valley, and he saw, a, behold, the smoke of ascended like the smoke of a furnace. So whatever it was, it was able to generate a lot of, lot of fire. One of the things we need to note is that the Dead Sea is located uh, um, within what's called uh, uh, the Dead Sea Fault System. This is uh, a slip strike fault, a uh, massive uh, a tectonic junction occurs at this region that the Dead Sea is square in the middle of. Uh, and it is, uh, that at its surface, the lowest elevation on Earth. So the surface of the Dead Sea is 1,400 feet below sea level. 1,400 feet below sea level. And, uh, and it is part of the Dead Sea Fault System, uh, a slip strike fault. It's one of the largest continental slip strike faults in the world. The fault occurs due to the contact between two of these big plates, the Arabian plate and the African plate, and represents a key tectonic feature in the region. So it's a very geologically active area. And uh, remember, I pointed out those tar pits. So we know that there were tar pits in the regions, the valley, the kings after this war fell into them when fleeing into these tar pits. And we believe those sinkholes that we find in that area are probably uh, from these tar pits. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that God worked in destroying Sodom through possible uh, you know, geologic activity, the geologic activity that was already present in the region, triggering an earthquake and expulsion of material up onto, up onto the valleys of the plain. Seems to be a, a possible uh, cause of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, a geological event triggered by God. Mm, all right, it's getting through Sodom and Gomorrah ate up some time, that's for sure. And I only got 30 minutes left. And Egypt is going to take a whole lot more time than 30 minutes. So I'm just going to go as far as I can get. Oh, I, do, I do have a couple of really cool things I want to show you. So I, I may get close to the end and try to skip ahead because there's a couple of cool things uh, you probably have never seen. Okay, we want to try to place Egypt, the events in Egypt, into the biblical history. Okay, so we want to look at this, and, and, and again, uh, our goal here is to try to, uh, try to place some key biblical events. Egypt, uh, as you might guess, comes into existence shortly after the dispersion at the Tower of Babel, or Tower of Babel, if you prefer, uh, which uh, was, a, was around 2100 B.C., uh, possibly. Uh, and, and we know that uh, Egypt was actually founded by one of Noah's grandsons. According to the book of Genesis, Noah's grandson, uh, by the name Mizraim, is the father of the Egyptians. Uh, in the NIV, this verse right here, Genesis 10, 6, reads, The sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So it actually inserts, instead of Mizraim, there it actually inserts uh, Egypt, because uh, Mizraim was the father of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ham, as you probably already know, is one of Noah's uh, three sons. His sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Mizraim, Noah's grandson, father of the Egyptian nation. Uh, just another passage for reference here. Um, this is when uh, Joseph, Jacob had died and Joseph was taking him back to bury him in the cave of Machpelah. Right? And before, on, on the way back, they stop at this threshing floor, threshing floor of Atad and, and mourn. Near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly. And there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. When the Canaanites who lived there saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they, they said, the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That is why that place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizraim, which means mourning of the Egyptians. So Mizraim, just another name for Egyptians in a way. And according to Eusebius, a 4th century A.D. historian, 
he says Egypt is called Misdraim by the Hebrews, and Misdraim lived not long after the flood. For after the flood, Ham, son of Noah, begat uh, uh, Egyptus, or Misraim, who was first to set out to establish himself in Egypt at the time when the tribes began to disperse this way and that. Misraim was indeed the founder of the Egyptian race, and from him the first Egyptian dynasty must be held to spring. So it's this Misraim that we get Misr, the present Egyptian name for Egypt. Modern Egyptians call themselves Misr, an Arabic word for Egypt. Note uh, Misr on this insurance sign that I found for you on Wikipedia or someplace, found it online. Okay, just a little background on the Egyptians. Now, the earliest historical evidence of uh, a people found outside of, Israel, found outside of the Bible is an Egyptian stela. This Egyptian stela, referred to as the Merneptila stela, contains the earliest historical evidence of the Israeli people outside the Bible. Um, dates to around 1230 B.C. Uh, uh, Merneptila stela is, yeah, it, is uh, dated to about 1230 by the conventional chronology, which we're going to have to challenge, I'm afraid, and that's going to make things a little messy here for us. <clears throat> but this stela has the phrase on it, Israel is laid waste, its seed is not on this stela. Now just so you know, a stela uh, is a big stone tablet looking thing that uh, they, would tend to, uh, they, they, they would tend to commemorate important events on stela. So uh, after a war, they would always uh, you know, make declarations about the battle, who defeated who, and, or after big construction projects, oftentimes they would put up a stela. And uh, this stela was actually written on both sides. Okay, what, what we're going to have to deal with a little bit here, and I almost hate to do it, is uh, the, and we have to recognize that there's a problem with the, the Egyptian dates, with the Egyptian chronology. Uh, uh, in general, the dates fall far beyond what the Bible will allow for. I mean, it extends far you know, before uh, 3000 B.C. This, this requires that the, globe, the flood of Noah would have been occurring during the first and second dynasties. So there's definitely a problem with, with our dates here. And, and so this is the standard chronology that, uh, that's, that's applied to, to these Egyptian dynasties. And, and we, we know there's some problems with this. It, it's been long recognized, but unfortunately, some of these dates have been uh, uh, so set in the minds of some of these uh, archaeologists, it's hard to shake them. But wh one of the problems with some of this dating is the fact that the, the, the dynasties, a dynasty was a, 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 a family would be in power for a period of time. And then when that family lost power and another family took over, that would be a new dynasty. So these families were basically, uh, these dynasties were family ruling periods of time. But uh, one of, it was assumed, I think, in the beginning that these dynasties uh, were, uh, one, were one right after the other rather than being co-regents. So these dynasties frequently overlapped. Uh, one person would start reigning before the other one was, uh, was dead. And uh, so these dynasties frequently overlapped because they were, they were co-regencies during many of these periods. And uh, this would also, but the standard chronology would also place Joseph in Egypt during the second intermediate period, but there's no sign of him there. Moses is placed in Egypt during the, what's called the New Kingdom, uh, but the devastating plagues that are referred to there, no sign of those, or uh, you know, the army being lost in the Dead Sea, any of those kind of things. Um, so, but where we get our information about, Jesus, about Egypt from several sources. Um, we get it from uh, numerous inscriptions, texts, papyrus, uh, documents and artifacts of various types, and from uh, a number of uh, very important historians. Uh, for example, uh, Herodotus, Manetho, Josephus, etc. Manetho composed a, a history of Egypt for the Library of Alexandria in the 3rd century B.C., Herodotus, the famous Greek historian, traveled to Egypt in the 5th century BC and interviewed priests and other uh, knowledgeable individuals in order to uh, write a history of Egypt. Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, quoted from Manetho when writing his historical anthologies in the 1st century. Africanus and Bishop uh, Eusebius, uh, renowned historians writing in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD respectively, also quoted Manetho and wrote about uh, Egyptian history. Um, 
all of these are highly esteemed historians, uh, but they often disagree with one another in, uh, in calculating the Egyptian chronology. Uh, uh, but the heavy reliance upon Manetho is the biggest problem, I think, that, that we have here. Uh, Manetho, again, was an Egyptian priest who wrote, uh, 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 wrote a history of Egypt in the third century BC, and many consider Manetho's writings to be indisputable fact. Uh, he was skill, clearly skilled at deciphering the hieroglyphs and had uh, access to inscriptions and documents and other valuable artifacts. However, two problems have emerged from accepting Manetho. One, none of his writings have survived. We have not one single piece of Manetho's uh, work with us today. All we have are quotes from other people. Um, uh, and, and his writings were hundreds and in some cases thousands of years after the events took place. But again, none of his writings survived. The only source we have of his writings are some of the statements that uh, have been, had been quoted by Josephus and Africanus, Eusebius, and, and others. But uh, what some have, uh, have taken to try to revise the Egyptian chronology, uh, David Down and some others have been very instrumental in this. Um, by recognizing, again, that some of these dis the dynasties were contemporary or co-regents with each other, the uh, revised uh, chronology dramatically collapses the time scale that's involved here and helps harmonize uh, some of these important events with the Bible. Um, with this revised chronology, the chronology on the bottom is a revised chronology that's been proposed by David Down, an archaeologist has done extensive work in Egypt, etc. And uh, others have, this seems to be fairly well accepted by, uh, by many of your scholars in the area. But, uh, uh, and there's another, there's another complication with trying to uh, establish the Egyptian chronology, and that is how long the Israelites were in Egypt. This is a huge debate over how long the Israelites were in Egypt. It's referred to as the short versus long sojourn. And it's, they were in either Egypt either 430 years or 215. And that's a substantial difference when you're trying to place these events with uh, specific pharaohs whether they were there 215 years or 430 years is a significant difference. Okay, one of the key passages is this from Exodus 1240. Um, so now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Uh, now this is Masoretic text, uh, that's the NASB. However, Samar the Samaritan Pentateuch and the, Septu the Greek Septuagint um, both add uh, Egypt and Canaan. So they were and adds and their fathers to the sons of Israel. So they put Israel, Israel and their fathers lived in Egypt and Canaan 430 years. So that's a, a verse that is a part of the debate here over the length of sojourn. The other is from Paul. From Galatians 3, he makes a specific statement about the length of time involved here. Uh, Again, uh, Galatians 3, 7, Paul says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and, his, and to his seed. He does not say, and his seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What am I saying is this. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by, by God so as to nullify it. So 430 years, he's placing from the time that the covenant was given to the time the law was given, from Abraham to Moses. That's uh, Abraham, from covenant to Abraham to the law given to Moses. That's how he's putting 430 years. But uh, uh, let me, so I actually found the, so, and this is one of those areas where I cannot claim, I cannot claim uh, authority on any of this subject, <laughs> one way or the other. So don't, but uh, this one in particular, I tried to look into this and, you know, I tried to look to experts. What are the experts saying? Are they short or long? Short, long, short, long, short. I'm finding like 50-50 split. I cannot manage to, to figure out where people are citing on this. But I, I found two, two, a short, two different articles, one supporting the sh using, this pass, using this verse to support the short so sojourn and another article using this same verse to support the long sojourn. So let me give you the briefs on this. Um, mm -mm. Paul's, uh, Paul's reference to 430 years between the promise 
and the law, promise and the law, expressly uses the plural promises. That is, it denotes the chain of promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, finally affirmed on Jacob's last night in Beersheba. Thus, the direct promissory declarations of God to the patriarch ceased at the time when Jacob went to live with Joseph. And Paul is figuring from this point, under this view, Paul as well uh, makes Israel sojourn in Egypt 430 years. Oh, we did the wrong one. I did the wrong one. Sorry about that. That was the long sojourn. Uh, did you? Sorry about that. Okay, supporting the sojourn, so short sojourn, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.17 supports uh, a, sojourn, a short sojourn by affirming that from the promises spoken to Abraham to the giving of the Mosaic law, the total lapse time was 430 years. And since we know Israel was in Canaan 215 years, that's pretty well established from numerous biblical references, that would put uh, them in Egypt for 250 years as well. Anyway, that creates a complication for trying to uh, uh, you know, identify some of these events. Okay? And we can, find, uh, we can find a number of problems uh, between the Egyptian chronology and other civilizations as well. For example, this is a black obelisk. Um, it provides an important example of a biblical Assyrian historical synchrony and illustrates as well that uh, a substantial problem with the Egyptian chronology exists. The Brac Obelisk was erected as a public monument in Assyria around 825 BC. It displays the earliest ancient depiction of an Israelite who was King Jehu, who had come to pay tribute to the Assyrian emperor Shalamanzer III. So it shows paying of a tribute by King Jehu to Salamanzer III, and according to this Assyrian chronology, Salamanzer III reigned from 859 to 824 B.C. According to the biblical chronology, King Jehu reigned from 841 to 814 B.C. So you're talking about only a, a difference there of about a decade. Pretty good alignment there between those. I mean, only about a decade of difference. However, we find stark uh, deviation between the Assyrian and Egyptian chronologies. Um, according to uh, the Egyptian chronology, the Hittites were wiped out in 1200 B.C. Uh, let me read you this. According to the Egyptian chronology, this is David Down, uh, and timing is everything. According to the Egyptian chronology, the Hittites were wiped out in 1200 B.C., but the Assyrians write of wars against the Hittites in the 8th and 9th century B.C. What were the Hittites doing 500 years after they were wiped out? Not only are the Assyrians making war against the Hittites in the 8th and 9th century, but they war against kings with the same names as recorded in the Hittite records 500 years later. There's a problem. With the Egyptian chronology, that is hundreds of years off. Hundreds and hundreds of years off. Making uh, our job of synchronizing the biblical chronology with the Egyptians a challenging task indeed. Okay, let's uh, come back to that. Mm -hmm. So... Let's, we know that Abraham came from the Ur of the Chaldeans. And uh, this is what's called the Great Ziggurat at Ur. Uh, this, is, this photo was actually taken in 2005 uh, when the American soldiers were in occupation. This is the Ali Air Base uh, in Iraq in 2005. Nonetheless, the Sumerian city of Ur, where this ziggurat is located, has been... Uh, Popular identified as being Ur from, by, since like 1927 when, Char, when uh, Sir Charles Woolley first uh, argued for that. However, Josephus, Islamic tradition, and Jewish authority uh, all concur that uh, Ur Kasdim, the Ur of the Chaldeans, was in northern Mesopotamia, not south, southeastern Turkey. Nonetheless, it's a pretty cool ziggurat there that I thought. You want to know what a ziggurat is. If you didn't know what a ziggurat it was, a ziggurat, it could be that that's what the Tower of Babel was, was one of these ziggurats. It was supposed to serve as a bridge between sky and earth. The gods are believed to descend and visit the temple where only a select group of priests and governors um, may enter in the, in, with, and, and commune with them. So we know Abraham uh, came into Egypt. Uh, uh, we, the best uh, date we can put on this uh, is 875 B.C. Uh, Abraham arrives in Egypt. And uh, Josephus said that he communicated to them arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abram came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with these parts of learning. 
for that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt. That's a quote from Josephus. Okay, uh, so, and uh, it is noteworthy that at this point in time, uh, the, the Egyptians seem to develop some remarkable construction abilities. Um, uh, for example, uh, let's see, uh, this, the pyramid that you see here, this is one of the, the great pyramids of, of Khufu, that's uh, mm, <clears throat> uh, before Khufu, the early Egyptian pyramids were, were uh, not really great, uh, are, they were, but they were not, uh, they, I mean, they were great construction projects. I'll show you a couple other pictures of some more ancient pyramids, but they were not perfectly square or exactly oriented onto the four points on the compass. This was one of the first pyramids that is lined up to the four points on the compass. A remarkable, remarkable task, showing knowledge of both arithmetic and, and astronomy, which according to Josephus, Abraham introduced those into Egypt. So this pyramid likely would have been built after uh, Abraham's arrival in Egypt. Uh, just so you know, that pyramid, is, I don't know if any of you have been there, but that is 500 feet tall, 50 stories. 50 stories tall. It's almost unimaginable. Okay, also a, a noteworthy point, uh, these pyramids weren't standalone structures. These pyramids is a schematic to, sh to show what the pyramid of Khufu and of Khafre, uh, wh what else was around them at the time. These were surrounded by a huge funerary complex. Temple complex surrounded these pyramids. The pyramid itself was a tomb, but other tombs surrounded in huge massive temples as well all right so let's try to place joseph i'm gonna run quickly out of time uh, there's something i really would like to show you about joseph if i can get there um <clears throat> so we know that out of jealousy joseph was sold by his brothers to midianite merchants who then sold joseph in uh in egypt to potiphar one of pharaoh's officials then we know the story that uh, Joseph interprets this dream for Pharaoh, which ultimately lifted him to power within Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh, so pleased by, uh, by uh, Joseph correctly interpreting his dream, his dream, the Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger, put it on Joseph's finger. He then dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Okay, so can we place Joseph? Mm, we're going to try. Um, this stela, uh, called the famine stela, was discovered that describes a terrible seven-year famine. And it's known by the locals as the Hungry Rock. It says, I was in mourning on my throne. Those of my palace were in grief. My heart was in great affliction because happy the river God had failed to come in time of a period of seven years. Grain was scant. Kernels were dried up. Kernels were dried up. Scarce was every kind of food. Every man robbed his twin. Those who entered did not go. Children cried. Youngsters fell. The hearts of the old were grieving. Legs drawn up. They hugged the ground. Their arms clasped about them. Couriers uh, that were needy, temples were shut, shrines covered with dust, everyone was in distress. Terrible seven-year famine described in this. But uh, it's a little bit out of sync. Um, actually, uh, there are uh, there, some have tried to take the revised Egyptian chronology proposed by David Down and others and attach the long show, sojourn to it. And if you do, then uh, that puts Joseph out and where this would event would fit within the third dynasty um the this this stela actually mentions a third dynasty king by the name of dejoser who built uh, one of the step pyramids of zagara um mm, mm, mm. It is suggested by this, if, if Joseph does fit in, in with this scenario that he he might be identified as Imhotep um but Imhotep was the, not only the chancellor of, uh, uh, under Dejoser, the, the third dynasty king, but he was also the high priest of the sun god Ra. And I don't really see Joseph being the high priest of the sun god. You know what I mean, Ra? I just don't think what we know about Joseph are that he would actually be that. So, uh, but 
under the revised chronology and the so short sojourn. Um, oh, one other point I should make. This, uh, this stela, this rock that you see here, the, the hungry rock, whatever they call it, was discovered on an island called uh, Island of Sahal, which during the Greek period was uh, the place where any budding scribe would go to practice their art. Apparently on this island, every flat piece of rock is carved up with the hieroglyphs and engravings and stuff. So it's very possible someone came to this island hundreds of years later and wrote up this stela. You know, it wasn't historically accurate. It mentions one king in a famine from another. So, but based on the uh, revised chronology, revised Egyptian chronology in this so short sojourn, uh, some would place uh, Joseph out in the 12th dynasty under Sesestros I. So this would have possibly been the Pharaoh when Joseph I became viceroy. Sesestros I is the second ruler of the 12th dynasty. Um, and he is known to have given extraordinary power to a viceroy by the name of Mentuhotep, and many scholars have argued that this might, should, person should be identified as Joseph. Uh, because to bow down to a viceroy was completely atypical at best, but entirely consistent with the kind of power that Joseph had been given. Egyptologist Emil Burks, in a word, our Mentuhotep appears as the alter ego of the king. When he arrived, the great personages bowed before him at the outer door of the royal palace. So, could that be Joseph? It's possible. It's possible. This relief right here was discovered in the tomb of, a, of a, an Egyptian governor during the reign of Sesestros II. And the paint is a painting that evidently registers a real event that took place where a group of 37 Semitic uh, uh, Semitic uh, people paid custom duties to a, a, the monarch's officials. The leader of the caravan is, is named Ab Abu Shai, which is a distinctly Hebrew name, and is actually one of uh, King David's uh, top generals, the uh, name of one of King David's top generals. Um, what is also remarkable, if you look closely at that, is that they are bringing advanced wares to Egypt. And it is uh, assumed that everything they're shown bringing to Egypt was not present in Egypt up until that time. And so you can see they bringing metal smithing equipment. You can see an anvil there and, uh, and a bellows being carried on the back of, one of that donkey. So that's, a, that's an anvil and a bellows that you can see there. You also see uh, uh, a curvilinear a bow, a laminated bow that was uh, being carried by one of the troops. At the time in Egypt, they only had, uh, soldiers were using a simple arched uh, twigs for bows. And you can also see one of them has a 12 string harp um, and the intricately woven fabrics that you see them wearing too. All of this uh, describe what the people of, what this Semitic group was bringing. And these could be the people that were coming to Egypt during the famine, bringing, uh, bringing their wares. Okay, but I want to show you one kind of cool thing that you probably have never seen, or maybe you have. Has anyone ever heard of the Bar Yosef? This is pretty cool, okay? An ancient canal system, I'm going to have to quickly get to the end, but I'm going to do my best to finish on time if I can. An ancient canal system known as the Bar Yosef, which literally is translated into the waterway of Joseph, was discovered in the late 1800s by an American engineer by the name of uh, Francis Cope Whitehouse. White House was retained by the British to resolve the problem of increasing the, uh, the amount of farmable land in the desert regions of Egypt. In surveying the desert, he realized that the problem of the de desert irrigation had been solved centuries before. White House became intrigued by a small freshwater lake that he found out in what's called the Fayoun, uh, around a Fayoun oasis. He found a small freshwater lake that did not appear to have a water source, a visible water source. So he followed from that lake traces of a canal leading into it that uh, was apparently creating this artificial, a lake that is apparently artificial lake. But he found as he tracked this canal back that it was but a tributary of a much larger canal that parallels the Nile for several hundred kilometers. Uh, White House looked for references and found uh, references to this lake in, in antiquity. Um, this is from Herodotus. 
Um, Herodotus was a Greek historian again lived in the fifth century and is regarded as the father of history in Western culture. He describes this lake. The water of the lake does not come out of the ground, which is ex here extremely dry, but is introduced by a canal from the Nile. Mm, a summary of White House's discoveries were made by Kerninsky in uh, The Eighth Day, The Hidden History of the Jewish Contributions to Civilization, um, according to, uh, according to Kersky here, Kerninsky, Kerninsky, around the lake's perimeter, as well as at considerable distance from its shore, White House came across the ruins of an ancient dam, ditches, aqueducts, and a variety of structures that mutely testify to the existence of a vast and sophisticated irrigation system. Ancient fish bones, shells, and other signs, signs scattered about the, the sand surrounded the oasis unmistakably demonstrated that the lake had once been many times its current size. That yet another lake had existed that had since dried up and that a canal system that fed into and out of the lakes had extended the arable land far beyond its contemporary boundaries. So White House convinced that the solution to Egypt's uh, water need issue was the reconstruction of this ancient canal system. He ver fervently presented this case in, in 1883 to the Ge Geographical Society in Cairo. In June, he pressed his case further with the Society of Biblical Archaeology in London and then kept pressing his case in a series of lectures and pamphlets, but was ignored. Others... However, later, finally came to appreciate the value of this ancient water system and recommended its reconstruction. The entire ir irrigation system was eventually reconstructed without crediting White House in any way. The modern day Joseph's Canal now supplies water to two million people living in the Fayoun and the vast farmlands of the region. You can see, I don't know how well you can see this, if I can get over to it. This is the Nile over here, and this is the Bar Yosef, the canal that par parallels the Nile. The canal system in Egypt that's there today, I'll let you see it right here. The canal system in Egypt, referred to as Joseph's Canal, is apparently a modern-day reconstruction of an ancient system possibly built by Joseph of the Bible. Legends both Judaic and Arabic have it that Joseph, the viceroy of the Pharaoh Sesestris II of the 12th dynasty, was responsible for this monumental contribution and a lasting contribution to the welfare of Egypt. And, uh, and the legend has uh, some factual foundation as well because we know that under Israelite rule, rule in Egypt, such vast projects were indeed carried out. And this is just the kind of thing you would expect to happen after a prophetic vision of a seven-year famine was might be made that you would start looking of ways of uh, combating the upcoming famine but i don't know pretty cool right had you ever seen the bar yosef the sea of joseph this canal system that they referred to as the bar yosef very interesting so i wasn't able to get in some of the other aspects of the chronology wanted to get into uh the Israelite slaves in Egypt, who was the Pharaoh of the oppression or of the Exodus, some of that, but we're just going to have to wait on that for another time.